We have. We will not use our entire time here. Uh, so there was going to be time at the very end of this. We have our exercise, our first exercise. My intention is to make this very simple, and very easy, and for us to start thinking about uh, some. So we're going to introduce some key metrics that we think about a lot at, at RevOps. Uh, and this is still very high level, and this will start to give us the language. And this is the first mob. Okay, so let's talk about what this is. So as a reminder, we finished class one earlier this morning. Um, it, we went over the definition of revenue operations, provided a more, uh, I'll go over a summary in this a second. But then class two, this is, keep it, keep it very, this is going to be nice and digestible. Uh, tomorrow is going to be a lot more full. This class two is B2B business model. We'll talk about what that looks like, and it's, it may change your mind about stuff, and, and you may be lots of questions on this. And then the effect of the business model on, on key RevOps metrics and how it affects how we think about our business. That's the two objectives. From these two objectives, here are the three questions we're going to go inside. What is the business model? What's the effect of the business model? And what are key trends inside the business model we see today that as revenue operations professional, we must be thinking about? Okay. Next, okay. As we're doing this, I'm going to attempt to be monitoring our Q and A, uh, so I will look over those, and I will also be monitoring Slack. So you can ask in either place, and I will do my best. Jan, please interrupt me if there's a question that needs an answer in as we go. So let me make sure I have this up. Here we go. I'm in the channel. Uh, Okay, um, so summary from class one is this, we did this, I'm gonna go real quick, is RevOps is not new. And it's likely, and it likely doesn't have pillars. <laughs> uh, people have been doing it for a long time. Uh, it's just how important it is. Um, and the, the definition, as we've provided lots, we don't define things by their end states. We define, it is revenue operations, is the science of sustainable revenue growth that's repeatable, that's repeatable, can be replicated, has a process with, with a specific order that enables us to measure, repeat, improve, explain, and apply growth strategies uh, in an order of priority. And it's become more popular because internet access, loss of buyer journey, there's a bunch more data, business is more complicated, and SaaS people need revenue operations people to sell to. Okay, that's the summary. Yeah, we'll have this uh, recording if you want to go back through it. So what is the business model? How is this different than a go to market model? How is this different than a data model? Let's walk through this. Now, when I first was thinking about this and, and going through, I was I did not think the business model was that important. And as I was going through and building the data model, I realized, wow, this is actually the foundation. And we must have a fundamental idea of our business model and how it affects key differentiators um, in, in our in, in, in key uh, RevOps metrics. Um, as we said, Alex, you need to know what business model is your company. Quick tip, you that is the exercise. Like you're going to have to say, as part of your homework, is you're going to have to say, your company, what is its business model? So pay attention as we go through this. We do. So first, the premise, uh, why it's important in like understanding it is, the business model exists on a continuum for B2B. And there are three types of business models and you'll be, and you're gonna be in between this. On the left, all the way, and you'll see this drawn is perpetual ownership or ownership model. It then goes to subscription and the consumption and how, where, how we're selling our goods and how people are receiving our goods and paying for our goods. That affects our uh, many, several different RevOps. Uh, metrics and it allows us to understand this idea of a continuum, how we're being paid. We begin to understand key metrics like sales cycle, average um, contract value, win rates, risk curve profiles for like profitability of the business and, and who's assuming most of the risk, and go to market motions. And this will be the most important thing as we go in tomorrow. Like you have this is what it, you have to have this, or tomorrow uh, will not be as effective and won't be understood as well. So core premise, before we get into the model, the core premise number one is, and you heard me talk about this briefly or hint at it in class number one, that is, this is vertical agnostic. Well, it is not, go to, it is not um, 
Uh, it is a B2B. So it only applies to B2B. Uh, and this, this is different. So like, there's a different business model, like framework uh, that this is applying to if you have a B2C. But this does apply for channel sales. It does provide for resellers. It provides for affiliate marketing. It, what it doesn't apply to is like B2C companies, although it can be used and made to use for it. Just know like corporates, vertical agnostic. Many times I'm working with HubSpot and they're like, hey, Matt, do you, or, or somebody asked me, hey, Matt, do you have experience in this random vertical? Uh, let's do a healthcare vertical with this. And it is important to have vertical knowledge because you understand the players and you understand like the bet, most ways to make things efficient, efficient. but it, vertical matters a whole heck of a lot less than your actual uh, business model of B2B. And do you have experience in the business model of either uh, ownership, subscription, or consumption. So that's what I just as a point. Number three is journey. Uh, this is a exist on a continuum from a level of, of journey from uh, of recurring revenue. So you're going to see this. It's from I can own this product for the lifetime, right? I'm going to own the product for five years, and then I have to then do another large, extremely large purchase, or all the way to consumption, like an AWS server where I only pay for what I use. Now. You'll see, like, based on how we're doing that, just know we're on the journey, and everyone's on this journey. It just depends on where you're at. So here, now we're going to go over, we're going to understand this model, and we're going to look at it uh, and talk about the history and how it evolved. I'm going to take a side step is, remember, ask questions. There is a question. I'm going to answer it now. Question is, if I am to migrate a sales database from on-premise to cloud, uh, am I doing DevOps or RevOps. I emphasize that this move is to favor sales analysis efficiency and thus revenue on premise to cloud. Uh, the answer is we at Red Partners is all the time, right? We'll have five different databases uh, and we will manage the product database um, and the marketing database and the sales database um, of companies and moving it to the cloud. I consider that a a very specific function, almost a foundational place of where your CRM data is held and stored. I would consider this dev, and so at this point, revenue operations, you are doing it, you're doing a function of that, and DevOps or data operations actually fits within revenue operations. So that's how I'd answer that. Okay. Question, how effective is this model? I think it's extremely effective. How complex is this model? Not very complex, you're about to see it. Uh, what's a practical example of consumption? Uh, we will go through that and I'll answer that here in a second as we go through. Okay, let us, uh, let's go. So if you look on the left, this is pay up front, meaning you pay a large sum of money and you own it all the way to the right, which is a no, is a, is a no cure, no pay, meaning you could pay, uh, you, 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 it's like a freemium model. Sometimes you don't even pay for it unless you go up, unless you go up and it's just like freemium to paid function that Slack does is a good example. So it's a good example of of a freemium is Slack, you have a free version and you go up to paid. Consumption, Amazon, AWS, is, or Google, um, Google Cloud, or Azure, all of them are consumption based. Uh, and you'll see this in a second. Okay, so we start. The first ownership model that's on the left is call it on premise hardware or just on premise anything that like could be a manufacturing company that's selling a large piece of hardware to, um, to a manufacturing plant. It could be uh, selling to healthcare, where you are selling uh, um, um, like, you know, something you're only like MR, M, uh, a MRI uh, or some kind of scanning technology that you only buy you know one, once every five five years or four years. They tend to be extremely large purchases. Now this was very common and this existed. And we just to the point we had no way of having another type of model, right? There was no payments. Think bank. Think ACH. Think how someone was paid and our, our ERPs, meaning our um, enterprise resource management. So like our QuickBooks or NetSuite, like they just didn't have the functionality to collect things differently. So we just couldn't, we didn't have internet, right? So uh, as a point, so in the 1990s, we start moving further and further where we had perpetual software where you'd buy a software license um, and you would have access to some kind of software for a certain amount of time. Think Microsoft Office, right? You'd buy it every year, you get one year license, you'd go through. So then you get to the SaaS and, and you'll see this actually in the 2000s as the internet came to be and you, you notice that uh, as internet came to be, you had this ability to pay annual contracts, quarterly contracts, monthly contracts, and there's a new way to go to market. And this new way to go to market was selling subscriptions where people could pay for annual subscriptions, quarterly subscriptions, or even on a monthly contract 
from time to time. Uh, and this became extremely popular. And now in the 2010s, we started to move to consumption. This is the, 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 the base of AWS. And this was, we, this was not possible until uh, new ERP systems and the ability to actually track. So think you can, you can actually pay based on how much you use something weekly or daily or hourly or all the way to the by the minute. What's happened more recently in the 2020s is we're actually moving where you have both the consumption subscription. And we're actually moving back, trying to get multi-year contracts where you want as many, as many like you want to do a three or four, a three-year contract. And uh, this looks a whole lot like the ownership model. If you buy something for four years, you're essentially buying it for a long period of time. These large contracts happens in government and hospitals and healthcare and, and uh, state entities, right? So if you're looking at this, our business in some, in some way exists on this continuum, right? Like it exists on ownership, subscription, or consumption. And how we are billing and going to market, it does affect key components of RevOps. And it is important to understand and understand. It also affects who we're selling to, how we're selling to them, which we're going to next time with go to market. It affects like what go to market we should be doing based on what product we're selling. Yes, uh, may ask, is product-led growth a form of consumption model? Product-led growth is a go-to-market motion for sales that is used by a consumption business model. So you're hearing me be specific on this because PLG is not a business model. PLG is a sales go-to-market strategy, which we'll talk a lot about tomorrow. Uh, and it's only one aspect uh, of, of it. So really good question. Uh, and it's a good point. Okay, so let's go. This is the evolution of the business model. And we are, so, we are somewhere in this. PLG, which we hear is super popular. It's also super technical and super difficult to do. You talk about having to be good at revenue operations, go join a PLG company. Um, but there's also other aspects to it. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so let's talk about the effects of the business model on metrics and on profitability of a company for this. So number one, let's talk about the effect of your business model on sales cycle and your average contract value. So how large deals are. Um, before I go, I, I hear Denny is putting something in uh, talking about, I love that analogy, very similar to the structure I've been building for our subscription model. Our app is said to be an MRI for finance processes. It says telling to our techs, to patients, we focus on consulting firms, hospitals, we employ our tech to benefit the surf. Yeah. So like that, that's a good point. And so we'll talk about like how you're, we'll talk about your, what is your go. So this is your business model. We'll talk about your go to market functions tomorrow. Okay, sales cycle. So when you're looking at this paid up front, these are really long sales cycles, right? Nine to 18 months. And one of the key differences in these sales cycles is, um, is these are like large accounts. You may be like an Amazon's purchasing something or a Cisco's purchasing something. So large companies uh, that are, uh, you know, already have budget approval prior to doing it. So they have budget approval um, and they're like, and you, you're like knowing about projects. And so nine to 18 months. So think of the significance of this. If this is your business model, this means how your sales team is structured is differently. This means how you're doing sales ramp time. So for instance, if like you can't, you don't know if, I, if, if you have a 12 month sales cycle, how are you ramping and paying your sales team if it takes 12 months to close the deal which is like they're, they're pretty large impacts in this Next hey, is, matt sorry to interrupt uh someone asks uh, if you can define acv again uh, it is average contract value in every term terminology i believe there's a terminology sheet uh that that I created prior to this that uh i think kimberly has oh. shared well. I'll, I'll put it in the, in the, in the chat as well in the, yeah. just a this moment. Good. I'll, I'll answer these, but average contract value. Uh, sometimes people will talk in terms of total contract, uh, to, like a ETV, which is like one individual, but average contract value. So like average contract is over, uh, if it's a three or four year deal, how much money total is this entire deal worth? So next is we go to subscription. I mean, subscription changes the game here is you might have a 14 day sales cycle to a six month sales cycle, depending on how large it is, depending on if you're doing multi years, annual or quarterly or monthly and how people are buying, uh, how large those contracts are, are totally different. And as we go to our next one, which is 
consumption. I mean, this is hours to seconds. So you think about your sales team here. Do you even need a sales team? So you think about PLG, that's part of it. What is uh, PLG means product led growth, meaning your product is your sales team and you don't, you're not hiring a salesperson. So I just want the impact of this is your business model dictates how you're setting and structuring your sales team, your CS team and your marketing team. Uh, and it, it, it dictates what go to market motion you're going to actually choose, which we're going to talk about in the back end that allows us to start creating measurables. Okay, so that's your sales cycle, your ACV. Let's talk about win rates. So win rates change based on your business model. Well, let's explain them. Number one, business model of, let's say we're having a ownership model. These traditionally, it's where this, this is one of these best practices come up, is you have a one to three win ratio. Uh, and this is, there's, you are, due to the large scale of these, these deals, 500, a million, $2 million, $3 million deals, uh, most buyers are going to already have their budget done. These are going to be so many times RFPs. They already have their budget prior. This is where BANT came from. We talk about your qualification metrics, which is BANT is budget, authority, need, timing. This is where it came from in these large deals. BANT does not apply to consumption-based or subscription models, not in the same way. Uh, that's where Medic came into it. And there's a new one called Spiced, right? Qu your qualification metrics and what you're using to qualify changes based on your go-to-market metric, your, your business model as well. Next is, and we go to subscription, it changes to about a one and five. And that's where you hear that, you know, a really good ratio for industry standard is a 20% win ratio for uh, these subscription models that are, that are happening, occurring in here. And the, the reason is you have a lower win rate because they're shorter contract, uh, it, and it's easier to buy. And so people are coming that aren't totally qualified. And so you need a more sophisticated qualification metrics. You need better discovery calls run. Um, and these vendors, yeah. And there's, and there's big, and I spelled this wrong, but there's, they're starting to have more vendors per service being rendered. Well. Next, last is you'll see it one to eight. I mean, there's a super low conversion rate because these can be, some of these are free uh, and they don't turn into customer. They turn into customers after already using your product. Uh, and that is uh, the win rate just continues to drop at that point. And next is risk. We have another one after this. Okay, so uh, risk is, I think this is important because you think about um, this, is the risk will start dictating focus we're getting to next, it talks about where should you be focusing as a rev ops, uh, where you should be focusing the majority of your time, priority, priority of your time, um, making more, more efficient, more effective. So risk is, if you look at the left side, when you have this ownership model, it's almost all the buyer risk. What do I mean? The buyer could get fired if they spend a million dollars in your practice work. But that's not the salesperson's fault. I mean, this is where the whale of the deal comes in. The salesperson gets high five. That's great. You've got this whale. And after you have made the sale, you're done. You're not talking to the customer again, except for maybe a trip and Christmas cards, but you're done. And the buyer holds almost all the weight. And this is the revolutionary thing that has occurred inside our marketplace as we have moved away from this. Uh, but we still have remnants of this, of the, uh, like of this idea going by is what has changed it has, and it's a win-win for every, for people is sellers come at risk as we move to subscription. That means the buyer can walk away. Many times there is a, uh, their ability to get out of a contract. Uh, there is uh, small termination fees, or you have a non-binding contract where it's a month to month and you can end any time or a 90 day, 60 day opt out. And the seller is assuming that risk and they're not making money until one year that customer has to be a, I mean, that person or that business has to be a, uh, has to be a customer for six months or 12 months before they make any money. The seller's incurring all the risk of the infrastructure and the services. Now that's amazing for companies because now they can get this, they're democratized, right? They can now have access to, you only have to pay a, uh, you know, a $10 fee or whatever it is now for Netflix. Like you're going to think like 17, 18, you have to pay that fee. But Netflix is bearing all the, the millions of dollars of cost it, it does to deliver, right? Um, 
in the, in the, at the beginning is this consumption PLG model. I mean, it's beautiful. We all talk about we want to do it, but talk about risky. Talk about uh, uh, this is the buyers can stop at any time. Many times they can do it for free. Um, while it can accelerate velocity of a deal, um, like there's just an immense amount of pressure to get more users, get more users, get more users. Um, and as you see this, as you think about this, um, which business is easier to run? Which business is easier? And I, I asked this question uh, to the chat uh, and I'll put, look, I'm looking at Slacker here. I just asked the question, uh, which, which of these businesses is easier to run? Um, which, which business is easier to do RevOps at? And I'll give 10 seconds as I ask the questions. In the chat. Oh, uh, uh, while we wait for some uh, questions to come in, uh, there was one question that I, I, I saw pass that I thought was very interesting. Um, I think it's, yeah, it was a question by, by Farid. Farid asks, are these win rates for SaaS only or are they also applied to other products and services? Uh, no, they'll, they'll apply to other products and services. Um, so subscription and don't think about serve, like SaaS meaning software as a service. Any subscription business um, is gonna have that type of win rate for if it's B2B. And so that's a one to five. It'll go from one, it'll, it'll fluctuate. Like it's it's gonna generally 20%, right? 20 to 30% is really freaking good. For uh, big purchases, one to eight, uh, I mean, one to three, generally at 33%, 35% is where you're seeing the big deals lead. If, and at the very bottom, uh, that's where you're getting the 15% for um, even 10% for uh, these PLG premium models. Both of those are technically SaaS, right? That's what I mean, is you can be a PLG or a SaaS company, you can be a PLG, you can be a SaaS company, and you can be a uh, subscription. And this is why it's so important to have common language. What What's the business model? Is it consumption or is it subscription? Based on that, we can then have a better understanding of win rates versus, oh, I'm a SaaS company, it's PLG. Well, that's, should you be PLG? Like, what's your actual product, right? So sometimes... Uh, we'll, we'll get to that tomorrow is when should you change different go-to-market motions and, and how should you do it? Okay. Um, I am looking at this and I'm seeing a lot, uh, a lot of this. Uh, subscription plus variable usage is easiest. Pay up front is easiest. Subscription is the easiest. Subscription is the easiest. I will tell you this. Which one's the easiest to do revenue operations at and to run? It is always, always professional on the left side. It is always pay up front. And the reason is there's no upsells, there's no cross sales. You don't have to worry about retention as much and you have and you are getting money. That's why professional service businesses can become profitable after from month one. It's why it's why you see VC and P firms putting money and injecting money into consumption based because there's so much potential, but it, it is, it, it costs so much money and they're not profitable until 10 years down the road. Like is HubSpot profitable? No, it's not like, isn't that crazy? So it's like thinking about, you can be, you can run businesses uh, not profitable because of how much, uh, because of how large their target addressable market is and how much potential they have to grow uh, versus uh these larger, large deals are just more, much more difficult to earn. However, they're more predictable and they're easier to run revenue operations. So the RevOps world has grown up in subscription-based and consumption-based. And that's why there's a bigger need because all businesses are transitioning that way. Is That's where that's why we talk about um, the change in the business model has had an increased need for the science of revenue operations because there's more data, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I have some questions here that I'm gonna answer. Um, my question is, uh, learning from class one, if RevOps doesn't consist of pillars, should all RevOps team members have the same set of skills rather than specializing on different pillars? Uh, here, uh, so this is my opinion on this, is pillars are useful for theoretical, like how to structure a team and what, what, what functions the RevOps is doing. It's not helpful for how to actually effectuate and do revenue and study and create repeatable processes. So once you have a framework, you can go to a pillar and it can help, it can help you learn. 
but you need the framework first. And so this is what I'm trying to give. Uh, another one for our business model for the end customer, we have uh, uh, have upfront and subscription items. We would consider our business models the same for dealing with affiliates. Who's actually doing the selling? Um, so this is interesting. So this is where we go to go to market, and we'll have we'll, we'll talk about this in our models. Is end users have upfront and subscription? So if you are selling a product. Um, that the core business is what is the, where are you making money? What is the core element? What is your go-to-market? And, and that is your product. And if you look at big enterprise businesses, let's, let's use HubSpot as an example. How, where does HubSpot fit in this? Um, and I'll, I'll raise hands, Jan, for here. If you raise your hand, where does HubSpot fit within this model? Um, where did they start and where are they going? And as you think about this. Looks like and we have a taker. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, okay. Fareed, yep. Yeah. Where do you think they fit? Uh, for me, basically, it will be uh, on the monthly, on the edge of the monthly where the seller is at risk because obviously you can walk away from this monthly subscription. However, uh, and that's like the thing is, I think they are more interested in to get like to a more uh, annual quarterly way that is at least engaged to a contract for one year that you cannot walk away. I think that will be the most ideal for them because again, they don't have to worry about retention that much. 100% right. That was a perfectly answered question. Um, so what you said is right is HubSpot is works within this monthly and annual, and then they are attempting to push things back into multi-year contracts based on how large it is. One point, there is an upfront cost if you do pro or enterprise. Um, but you'll notice what has HubSpot done. HubSpot has done two things. Number one is they do take upfront payment, but it's very small. Mm -hmm. And if you work with a partner, they they are not bearing. This is a total another go to market for another for another company altogether. And there's a channel where they're helping sell deals, but they're helping sell these contracts. And then that go to market is different for uh, for partner companies. Just a point. Okay. Uh, that was, I think that's helpful, useful. Um, so I hope that answered your question, Bree. Uh, what what do you do in case that there have been different products and models? We have very long. So this is it. Is if there are different models inside your business, that means you're running totally different go to markets. That means your sales, and that's why there's probably confusion from your sales team who owns it, how your CS team supported. So tomorrow we're going to go over on how to think about enterprise sales versus SMB sales versus PLG sales. And then what if you have all the same together? Should you have different CRMs? Like you start to ask those questions and you can have answers uh, with this framework. Okay, uh, last question before I, uh, I continue on this. I am in a staffing industry, which I feel is very unique in determining business model. Technically, I would say we are consumption based as we definitely have a higher win ratio than one to eight. And our risk is a little more shared, though I would agree it's higher on the seller side. Thoughts, if you consider staffing consumption-based or hybrid. So I work with some staffing companies and there are usually two ways. Staffing companies um, are, in my mind, pay up front, almost always. Um, even, um, uh, it, 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 it's unique because you get the contract. Once you get the contract, you, uh, you then do, you can work two different ways, right? You work on a retainer and uh, a lot of staffing companies attempt to get retainers. So they're paid up front. Um, and then they, then they get paid, but they're paid monthly or quarterly over here, right? Uh, more, more consumption. You only pay with what you get. What the, the staffing, what there also is, hey, you're only paying if you hire. And I forget the word for that, but it's you only pay, yeah, temporary staffing. That is here. So what you're seeing people do is that we're transforming go to market. Like I do revenue operations as a service, right? We are rev, rev, uh, rev, uh, rev partners. We have taken, hey, you don't have to hire somebody. Think of like, you have to hire a rev ops staff over here. We have democrat, like we have changed it where you can subscription your revenue operation services. And we pushed it over here. This is what companies are doing, right? They're trying, like this is a, we, we take all the burden. We hire the people, we train the people and you can fire much easier. This is why RevOps, um, you can essentially SaaS subscription anything today.
And, um, and that, that's where you see all the innovative go to, uh, business models that are, that are happening across verticals, right? But it's all the same. Okay, I said last question. Uh, my business sells a SaaS product, online professional learning, but it also includes lots of professional services. Both services and online learning are paid up front. How does this fit into the model? It is fully paid up front. So um, this is B2B, um, and it sounds like that's B2C, but you may have uh, businesses that are buying from you. Um, in my mind, all of that is, uh, depending on your go-to-market, for professional, ser professional services, it's squarely on the left. For, uh, and it depends on how you're paid and how long a contract is. So I run a professional services company, and we don't do any upfront. We only do subscriptions. So we're over here. So they pay monthly. If you pay, if you have a class that you pay everything for at the very beginning, um, it's it's going to be over here. If it's B2C, this is why this model doesn't work for B2C. If it's B2C, you may actually just be over here because it's, a, it's an hourly class or it's a weekly class that you pay up front for. And it's just a collection mechanism that you're changing, right? So that's where I'd say how, you, how you're thinking about it. And so B2C doesn't work here because B2C, uh, your win rate will be a lot lower in every model because you have a you know, thousand people coming to your website, only 10 of them convert. That is not, that is a 1% conversion ratio. That is not a 10%. Okay, I'm gonna keep, there's so many questions. Um, what about professional services that run contingency? So that is literally usage-based. Contingency services is literally usage-based because you're saying, and this is the point and you'll see this. Actually, I'm gonna use this as a transition. These business models change where you must focus your time. So let's look at this. I think this will be helpful as we think about RevOps. So we get this. So the, if you change your business model, it changes where you focus your time. What do I mean? If you have an ownership model, the fo your focus is on selling and closing deals. Ownership models, as remember, you have a high average contract value and a long selling time. And if you do not fit in there, even if you say pay up front, you're more likely on, um, on this side of the equation. And what do you, where do they focus all their time? And it actually makes sense. It is on closing deals because once you once you um, once you buy a a, a, a a you may be a plant and you buy a manufacturing service that's going to be there for five to ten years, and so what you're selling then is maintenance, and your maintenance business may very well be on this side, right? But there's two different businesses. Yet you're selling the piece of equipment, and then you're selling your insurance or your which is a different business model where you're paying quarterly over here on the left right side. But your focus is on closing and selling deals. The next is subscription. And this is why RevOps, this is what has happened. I said business is more complicated from class one. This is what I mean. Business is more complicated. You can't just focus. You can't have the manacle, as what by Design would say. You can't have the manacle focus on selling on the left end because you don't make money on selling contracts. You make money on reoccurring impact on the right side of the bow tie. And so this is what we call bow tie funnel. And we'll go over this much more detail tomorrow, but on the right side, that's where you make money. And so you most focus on sales and CS. And because the compound, because it's when the renewal occurs, it's when they're happy, it's after they're live, do you start making money? And it's less about the number of customers and then how long you have kept the customers. And then as you go to consumption, it's all about, are they consuming that thing? It's almost, it's like, it's actually, that's why it's called product-led growth. It's less about the sales function uh, that's why it's product gross is a common sales motion here. It's less about the sales motion and it's much more about you must drive an immense amount of volume of deals and then you uh, and then how you how good your product is and how well you do customer service. If you send t-shirts, if you send gift cards, if you send them smiley videos, whatever it is, just whatever it is, your CS team is the driver of your revenue, not your sales team. And that is a big shift. And we don't think about it that way very often. Okay. Um, I'm going to, um, I have some more questions as we go in here. I'll answer them. When you say win rate, one to three, one to eight, what stage does that start? Um, that starts from the, we talk about sales ops. That starts from um, technically SQL, which we'll go over the data model tomorrow, SQL, which is sales qualified lead to contract signed, which is commit. Uh, Meng, is the go-to-market motion the way you do sales or is it marketing or also part of CS? Wow, beautiful question. It's like a layup for tomorrow. 
Your our go to market motion, go to market motion is the most overused terminology and confusing terminology in revenue operations discipline today, period. Go to market motions are different by function, sales, marketing, and CS. And, they, and we talk about alignment. That's where alignment occurs. Is your, and we'll talk, we'll show you visually what this means. Is your sales and marketing and CS team all doing the same go to market motion to support your business model? It all fits. The answer is they're all different and they have different structures and they have different and how you execute them is different. Our business, this is Christina, our business model is very interesting. We have a third party platform that offers deals on SaaS subscriptions. I am on sales ops, which our salespeople reach out to sales SaaS companies to get them to list our site. No upfront revenue is collected. Our sales rep, uh, reps, profits are based on red share model after product goes live on our website, people are dying. What model would this be? Sounds like a, uh, a, a innovative way to do a, that's a, um, that's a go to market. So that sounds like it's a subscription, subscription or consumption model, right? Where it's occurring on the right side. The product is driving all the revenue, uh, sitting somewhere in between subscription and consumption. What you've changed is your sales go to market motion. So that's not a traditional sales go to market revenue sharing with sales teams posts going live is not, it's not common. Um, and so we'll, we'll go over that tomorrow. What are the five most common sales go to market motions? We'll talk about that. My VP says that tracking customer satisfaction is critical to ensuring sustainable sales. Do you agree? So when, when that, when the VP is saying that, and cause this is, this is one of these best practices things. And I don't, I'm assuming VP of sales or VP of something saying this. They are saying that the majority of our profit does not come from net new logos. It comes from retaining current uh, customers. And the retention of the customer has compound impact, which we'll go over tomorrow. And that is more important to our business than getting a net new logo. Thus, we should spin like that's important. Uh, that's what he's saying. And I, or she's saying, and I 100% agree. And we'll talk about that in detail tomorrow. Um, how does, how does having a mixed business model impact the difficulty of finding the optimal RevOps model? The example, professional services that are consulting up front, but also have an option for managed service in the long run. I mean, this is our business model. So, uh, yes, it impacts difficulty, uh, because you must track the conversion from one-time onboarding into what we call cross-sale from a non-reoccurring to reoccurring revenue. Uh, it does uh, have additional complexity and that's why revenue operations exist uh, so that professional services can turn into consumption mo uh, subscription models uh, and anything that is moving towards you know anytime that is moving towards subscription uh, is multiplicative like multiplicatively or exponentially more difficult however it also has a higher um, potential to make profits um, a HubSpot partner can sell subscriptions, retainers to manage their accounts. We've got both sides. Yes, agreed. Uh, what is considered a good or average revenue retention rate for an annual subscription model? We'll go over this, um, some metrics. We'll go over that, our data model uh, because uh, we're going to break down each one of the conversion metrics you should be tracking. Um, and that, that specific conversion ratio, I'll show you. Like We'll, we'll go over that um, uh, tomorrow. Or, or on day three. Um, would you say that HubSpot's focus is consumption as the way you can increase recurring revenue is by increasing prior to current? HubSpot is not consumption, uh, ex which is funny. They're consumption for marketing contacts, uh, but they have monthly contracts. So if you see you're paid, they, uh, it, the hit here, right? You have to, they're, they're, they're looking at how many marketing contacts you're using monthly. Uh, but if you have sales pro ops hub, uh, service hub, you're paying by seats. Uh, and so they're recalculating monthly. And then based on your contract, you're either going to charge annual prorated or quarterly. So they sit firmly within this annual and monthly uh, firm. And that has like how they do revenue operations is uh, that affects how they do that. Um, okay. I have been answering questions for a long time. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish here just to make sure we go over exercises and I'll continue answering questions um, as we go. Uh, gosh, these are good, great questions. I want to answer them. 
Okay, I'm gonna finish this down, I'm gonna answer it and I'll do this. Okay, common trends. So what do we see happening in the business models um, over time? Number one, uh, you are seeing perpetual or ownership models attempting to become subscription-based models. Uh, you see this in professional services, you see this and you'll see um, large enterprises trying to take their service and turn it into subscription because uh, they're trying to read uh, the, there's lots of competitors and they're trying to they're trying to change. Now, here's the issue and here, here's common common mistakes is when you change your business go to market, when you change your business model, it requires a total new go to market motion. And a total new go-to-market motions for sales, marketing, and CS requires new structure and team structure and a new product. So just you're essentially starting a new business. Uh, and that's just to be. And so each one of these all is, is saying that. Um, you have um, it, 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 um, existing software companies are attempting, and I actually have this wrong way, they're going from subscription and they're attempting to do multi-year. And you'll see this a lot because um, they're try they need cash, especially now, is the software companies that have had explosive growth and they now have a brand name are trying to go up market to enterprise and they're trying to get multi-year contracts because they need guaranteed cash so they can fund and become profitable. And so think about like this. Yeah, that's such a great, Frank, like, B, the BMW, like perpetual subscription, like that is BMW charging for heated seats. Yes. Instead of paying the thousand dollars or however much it costs to get a heated seat in my BMW, I'm just going to pay, I don't know how much it is, but $15 a month and it's actually cheaper. And you're right. Like that, they're changing, they're changing, uh, they're changing the way. They're just cheap. Um, this is uh, cash. So just think. Uh, perpetual is very profitable. Subscription has a larger target addressable market, and they are doing this to stay competitive uh, and have uh, better value propositions. Because as you remember, this creates a better value prop because they, uh, the consumer no longer bears the burden. Subscription base is you have people moving, it's actually from subscription to multi-year because they need cash. <laughs> That's why, I, yeah. And then you have consumption going to subscription. Uh, and this is because PLG is so f difficult to do. The most difficult rev op shopped and revit to do and to get right is you must have a total frictionless sell process. So you'll see PLG moving from PLG from this user seat to attempting to do monthly subscriptions uh, going the other way because it's um, because uh, it's honestly it's easier to charge. It's less it's less friction and they're attempting to get larger and larger deals. These are the common trends that you see through these. So as you look at a summary, as we get to the end of class two, a summary of these, I made a, a table, makes it easier to see. Uh, you have, let's go, perpetual ownership is large ACVs, low volume of deals, high win ratio, buyer has all the risk, and your go-to-market focus is your sales funnel. Subscription, you have multi-year to monthly contracts, smaller ACVs, um, uh, medium volume, Medium win ratio, 20%. Majority is still on the sellers. Like you have now crossed where anytime you start having a subscription base, you're putting all the weight on the sellers and you have both a go-to-market function on sales and CS. And that's the evolution of RevOps becoming more important and why it's becoming a word. Um, and then consumption base. And by the way, this change is where SaaS, pro SaaS companies are like, oh my gosh, I have new people to sell and I have more problems to fix. More, thus they created a SaaS product, subscription product, or a PLG product to, to help people do this model, this model. Um, consumption, as we talked about, pay as you go. AWS is a good example. Um, very, very low. I mean, maybe $15 a seat, right? Very, very $10 a seat, maybe even freemium like Slack. Uh, high volumes, low win ratios, all the risks on the seller. Uh, go to market is almost all CS. Okay. So we're gonna get a practice. Uh, but before I do that, I'm gonna answer some questions. Uh, does having consumption freemium based model mean that there should be more of an emphasis on data quality and accuracy as it relates to product usage in order to build automation flow? Yes, yes, yes. It's in, let me, I, I would state it differently. It's a great question. It's impossible to do PLG well or 
go to, go to market motion. It's impossible to do a consumption model without a rigid, well-defined, well-executed data model um, as you get uh, from 1 million AAR to 10 million AAR, which is where RevOps, RevOps like really wins. And especially as you scale up 100%. We work on a no success care. We work on a no success, no fee basis. The fees are percentage of success value, so consumption model. Contracts are for an average. Uh, contracts are for an average period of three years, but average sales cycle is so variable, anywhere from six months to eighteen month models. It's an RP, which seems contradictory to the description model. Um, uh, Karen, I don't know the specific question. It sounds like you're saying, hey, my business model does not fit within what we're talking about. So what, we have this like weird marriage and I'm gonna go here. Yeah, this weird marriage, what I'm hearing is um, of, hey, I have these, they're very large contracts if we win them, but we only win them when we have them. Uh, so we sit in this weird state of both ownership because it's this large chunk. However, we only win when we deliver well. Uh, so um, what I'd say is understanding the business model is you're still like the most important impact here. We think about this is you're going to have to focus on delivery. It's just as important of contract securing and you don't actually get profitable until back here. And so I, I would say, and, and how you're paid, I would say that is almost like a subscription model with a, with a, with a, um, with an interest, like a way you're getting success. So I just like as a point. When you shift from subscription focus model monthly to annual or multi, are you sacrificing CS for sales? Um, you know, it's interesting is the answer is no, but where you're putting money in initiatives, yes. So if you're going to do a, if you're going to get multi-year contracts, your sales process and how you must be better than if you're doing lower subscription, but you're not sacrificing. It's just where are you putting your emphasis and where are you putting your, as a, as a revenue operations department and putting your thought process, where are you attempting to create lift inside the business it, and your focus and how you prioritize your time changes based on your, based on your business model. That's what we're saying. Okay, uh, we are at, we are 11.52. There are more questions in here. Um, I am going to go over our, um, I'm not, we're not going to have time to do the practicum. We've almost talked them. So I'm going to do I'm going to, I'm going to talk through this so you hear it. And I'm going to go over our homework for today. So first is practicum. Imagine if, uh, imagine if your business was shifting from perpetual to subscription, how, or what actions would you set up for, uh, the new sales motion in your CRM? So I'm going to talk this out loud to you here. I'm going from perpetual or this ownership model to subscription. So thing number one, and I'm just going to, the most important portion, because if you think about focus is, and this is a relic of our ownership pass, is you must, if you're moving from perpetual ownership to a, um, and honestly, I think in HubSpot, we're going to, I'll show you in the class, uh, on day three, how to, how to fix this, but you must start tracking customer lifecycle post contract. Um, what do I mean by that? That means when we are in traditionally, uh, whether whatever CRM you're in, we're going to have almost all the left side sales funnel. All, we all have these like metrics, right? When this is what, we, what we're talking about tomorrow in our data model is for us to be able to do subscription models, you must have post customer segmentation. And we'll show you how to do that and how, how to think through those. So, because there are more conversions that happen after someone signs the contract. Because when they would go live, when they own board, so you're thinking about like the success getting retainer, like you have post contract, close, close one sales, you have another, you have other uh, segmentation in your database that helps you do conversion ratios past that. CS funnel stands for customer service funnel. Uh, hold off. Okay. Uh, and I just, we're going to skip this, but just know that when you do this, it affects your sales team and it affects your CS team. 